You are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel Care. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. Well, it's time to go to God's Word, and I can't wait to uh, continue to open uh, God's Word to you here today. You'll notice as you came in here today that we uh, have have given you a bulletin that looks different than the recent ones that we've given to you, and that is because uh, today uh, we are uh, taking a pause on our series in the book of Colossians, and uh, we're going to uh, soon, next, actually next week, start our Christmas series, uh, Let Earth Receive Her King. And, uh, but today was really kind of, there was a, a little bit of a gap and a real little bit of a space, and I did, um, sense that the Lord was saying this is a good spot to uh, conclude the theme that we've been working on all year, uh, where we've been asking God, would you build our faith? Would you build our faith strong? And I wanted to uh, be able to wrap this up with our church here, um, and today I'm going to do that and, uh, by looking at the book of Hebrews chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, please uh, pull them out right now. Hebrews chapter 11, whether you have a book or a phone that you have your Bible on, uh, take a look at, these here, at that chapter here today as we look at and ask the Lord to build our faith, to build it strong. I want to start with a question as you're turning in your Bibles and just ask you, have you ever trusted God when it seemed crazy and reckless to do so? Just think about that for a second. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you were trusting God for something that He had promised and everybody around you is like, man, that's crazy. Or, or like, that's, that's, that's not just crazy, that's reckless, it's stupid, like, why would you ever do that? Why would you ever put yourself in that position? And your answer was, well, God, God, God has promised me something. I believe it to be true. There, there's something worthwhile that I'm pursuing in this that is beyond what you can see. Have you ever trusted God when it seemed crazy and reckless? Actually, we have an example of this that has happened in our part of the world even just this week. This week, there was a man by the name of John Allen Chow who was killed in the Andaman Islands just off the coast here, north of us a little ways, claiming to be a missionary who was bringing the gospel to a tribe of people who have been intentionally left alone on this island. Every time that somebody has approached this island, they have violently rejected their attempts to land on the island. In fact, a couple of years ago, there were a number of fishermen that were killed as a result of coming too close to the island. And so the island was dangerous, untouched, and by the world standards, a decision had been made to not disturb their civilization there on that island. But John Allen Chow said, you know what, the gospel needs to go to this place. And I have to say that I think that he's kind of crazy and rather reckless, And I'm not even sure I agree with all of his methods and what he did, but he stepped onto the island and into eternity as arrows pierced him and he died. His journal said this, though. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worthwhile to declare Jesus to these people. You see, crazy, reckless, full of faith, believing that it was worthwhile to share the gospel with people who have never heard it? Have you ever trusted God when it seemed crazy and reckless? Now, I'm not saying like we have to all go to the island, okay? I'm not saying that that's what's next for us, but, but what is it that you're saying, no, I believe God in this, but everybody around you is saying, I'm not sure. You see, I think our, our faith, our belief is built on this kind of crazy, reckless faith that's hard to reconcile with logic and reason and the way the world does things. So we get ourselves into positions that require faith in a greater way, a stronger way, or else an abandoning of of our faith, saying that it's not true. Thinking about this, and we talk about eternal life in our faith. And it's crazy because eternal life happens not when we're alive, but It begins when we're dead. That seems crazy. We talked about the fact that we are blessed by a resurrection. We we have this resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it's the greatest thing ever, but we wallow in the dust of life 
mucking our way through this next week and all the lowly things that we have to face. We know that the Word of God declares that we are justified, meaning that God has declared that we have no sin recognized before Him because it's been paid by Jesus Christ, and yet we struggle with sin in our life every day. I've got to tell you, there are often times where I'm struggling with sin and, I'm go, and I ask the question, God, is this real? And a faith that sustains us is able to answer that in a positive way. You know, the Word of God says that we're blessed, but the reality is most of us are living in overwhelming mi- misery of some sort in our lives. The Word of God says that we, are, we have an abundance of good things, and yet we endure hunger and thirst regularly. God says that He will help me. But so often, He seems deaf to my cries. And so when we talk about building a strong faith, we're not just talking about some high church thing that we occasionally agree to. We're talking about the real life situations that we face each and every day. And having a strong faith is essential. Having a faith that is growing stronger is really required to be able to face each of those things. And so we're going to have to hold on and endure and persevere in some things with our faith if we indeed are going to find the firm foundation that is promised in it. If you have your notes this morning, I would encourage you to write down this statement. It's going to really circle our thoughts all throughout today. We need to persevere in our faith with steadfast endurance because God promises a great reward. It's really a simple statement. We're saying you have to hold on tight. You have to endure. You have to persevere. And you're going to have to persevere in such a way that you trust that there are promises in the future that are worthwhile holding on to while I endure some sort of suffering even now and today. Keep trusting. Don't give up believing. Look for the future promise. These are all the things that we're going to see the writer of Hebrews, tell us here this morning. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 11 here together this morning. It's 40 verses long. Let me read, let's take, take time to read these things and then see them all together. Hebrews 11, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what was seen was not made out of things that are invisible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, though through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and from him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles in the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. 
By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in fact, was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and that they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was growing up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he, had endu- for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood that so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down as they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that there might rise again a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about the skins of, in the skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Hebrews chapter 11. You know, it's often called the hall of faith. It's often called a a museum uh, of those who have had great faith in the history of the world. And in this, we see here really uh, an example, a listing uh, that is being told of how to endure in the midst of difficult circumstances, whether it be the circumstances of the world or even the discipline of God. The context helps us see this. If you look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, it says, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And we see here this phrase, you have need of endurance. And really, Hebrews chapter 11 is the, is the, are the examples of those who have endured and who have persevered in their faith and then received the reward that God had promised to them, even though they didn't receive it, for the most part, in the lifetime in which they lived. So this, this issue of endurance is really what we're talking about here in our message today. So I need a little bit of a help on this, and and Daniel, I'm going to ask you to come here for a moment. Uh, Daniel was not made aware of these things beforehand, so help him here today. Daniel, we we need to, you just go ahead and stand and face the crowd right there. I need to show them what this word endurance means. In the New Testament, the word endurance is known as hupomene. Can you say that? Hupomene. Hupomene. Now, you don't need to know Greek for a lot of things in the Christian life, but to help us understand what this means here today, you need to know hupomeno means endurance. And it means, it means that if I were to put a lot of pressure on Daniel, like this, and, and really, can you do it? Okay. And really get on top of him, take my feet off the ground, and put that pressure on him, that he remains under that pressure. 
And oftentimes in life, what happens when we have to endure something in life, whether it's the discipline of God or just suffering because of the brokenness of the world, what, what, what are we trying to do when the pressure comes down on us? What do you try to do? You try to escape and get out from underneath it. And, and I don't want that pressure in my life. And, and that's, no, 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 not yet. One more time, you need to illustrate. Hupomeno means that instead of trying to escape under the pressure, you remain under it. And so what we're seeing here is that we need to have an endurance, a remaining under whatever the pressure is in our life to have a strong faith, to build a strong faith, to have a faith that receives the reward that Jesus promises. Thank you, Daniel. So today, persevere in your faith and have steadfast endurance in it because God promises a good reward. I want you to have that picture of Daniel and the, and the pressure coming down on top of him. I want you to remember that, that when that's happening in your life, that, that really God's call in faith is remain under that pressure, allow that to produce an endurance that's in you. Here, here, here's something important. It, hupomeno means a capacity to bear up under difficult circumstances. It's often produced during suffering, and it often bears fruit of godly character. And so, a number of places in Scripture, we have this word, hupomene, this, this remain under the pressure, endure it, persevere in it. That's the call of Scripture for our faith. Persevere in your faith with steadfast endurance because God promises a good reward. Why? Why should we persevere in our faith? Why should we continue in that? Well, I think that as we see the illustration of all of Hebrews chapter 11 and the list that exists there, we begin to understand what it means. So if we're going to have faith for the future, if we're going to have faith beyond 2018, hupomeno, endure in your faith today because God has been 100% faithful in the past. That's really what Hebrews 11 is saying. It, remain under the pressure, whatever your faith is being pressured by right now. Remain under that today because you can look and you can see God is faithful. 100% of the time in the past, He's been faithful. So let's talk a little bit more about faith here for a second. It says in verse 1, look, look at Hebrews 11 verse 1 again. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the convictions of things not seen. We're seeing here really a description of faith, not a definition of faith. And the description says it's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It, you believe it even though you don't see it. There's a common phrase in our language that says, seeing is believing. But that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying, believing even though you're not seeing all the Evidence of God's promise. And that's what we've been trying to get to in our Building a Strong Faith theme this year. I would remind you that our theme verse comes from Isaiah chapter, chapter 9, where it says that if you're, if you're not firm in faith, you are not firm at all. All of us who are here at church today are, are seeking, desiring to have some sort of faith connection to God. And so it's not uncommon for us to say, yeah, I want to have that kind of a faith that has that connection to God. But, but what this verse says is if your faith isn't firm, if it's not built up, if there isn't a strength to it, you're not going to be firm in your belief. And so this strengthening is desperately needed in us and in that, I would just ask you today, can you really believe that God's way to restore relationship is through Jesus Christ alone? When we talk about faith, we're talking about our connection to God. We're talking about how we can have a relationship with God, knowing that it's broken because of sin, but that God made a way through Jesus Christ that if we believe in Him, we have a restored relationship with Him. Can you really believe that God's way to restore relationship is through Jesus Christ alone is the most important faith question we could ask. You know, as we look around the world and we see all the different religions, we understand that there's so many that, are, that, that have similarities to what we believe. There are so many that have a good moral and good ethic and, and, 
That doesn't seem to be, though, the way that God says we restore relationship. It's not by doing good things. It's by acknowledging that I'm not a good person, but Jesus is perfect, and that there's a massive transfer that happens. When I believe in the, in the truth of Jesus Christ, He places on me His perfection, even though I'm a dirty, rotten, terrible scoundrel. And that causes me to then live for Him out of delight, not duty. But that's the difference between a religion and a true followership of Jesus Christ. Can you truly believe that? That it's not based on your merit, but based on God's grace that you would have relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Let's just continue with this idea of faith, though. Let's try to give it a definition. we got a description. Here's a definition. Uh, Faith is believing what God says, even though I don't see it yet, and acting in full trust without regard to the consequences. Throughout the year, I've tried to give you definitions of faith from different angles, all describing the same thing, all kind of pointing to the idea of what exactly faith is. And in this, just kind of a twisting of some of the previous definitions, we're saying that it's believing what God says, even though I don't see it yet, and acting in full trust without regard to the consequences. Think about it. The idea of believing what God says. What is it that you have to believe to have this this saving faith? It's that you believe that what God says is true. You have to deal with the fact that there's unbelief in your life. And so you have to realize that I don't always see it. I've heard God say it, but I don't know if it's true yet. And so I don't know because I've heard this phrase, seeing is believing so often, and I kind of like the idea of the control of that. I have a hard time when I don't see things believing it. And so we have to deal with the unbelief part of it. But really, it's, it's an active faith. It's trust. It's not what you say that shows what you believe. You know that, right? It's what you do that demonstrates true belief. And, and so it's not just this theoretical, intellectual thing that happens kind of in our head and kind of in the concepts of the worlds that we walk into. It's this active, daily put one foot in front of the other, live life according to a belief system that Jesus has promoted to us, it's trust. We have to understand that faith is active. It's never passive. It's always putting our full weight of belief onto something. But notice here, the definition continues and it says, without regard to the consequences... This is the part where things get crazy and reckless. This is the idea of there's a reckless abandon to this belief system that might not result. Do you understand? This is so important. You understand that faith does not automatically mean deliverance in this earth. That faith, as demonstrated in Hebrews chapter 11, oftentimes is believing in something that is going to happen after I die and still understanding the value of it and putting the full weight of trust into that very thing. So many of the examples that are given, particularly at the end of the chapter, was that not a little depressing? You start reading the end of the chapter, what? Sold in half? What? (laughs) Faith doesn't necessarily mean deliverance in the here and now. And there's a reckless abandon that says, even after death, God's still going to be 100% faithful. We're going to follow it. And so in this, I would suggest that there's some very practical things that we have to have belief and faith in to even call ourselves a community. When I teach our party with the pastor, welcome lunch for visitors, and our membership class, we talk about how we want to be a place, and we say this by faith, that that is a place that welcomes without judgment. We want to be a place that practically puts into, into, into practice the idea that all men and women are created equal. And they might have different backgrounds and different cultures and different skin colors and different whatever, but in the midst of that, we welcome without judgment. And sometimes that means believing that what God says is different than what my experience has been in the past with a certain kind of person. We say that we want to be a culture of a church that we love without condition. Do you understand the impossibility of that statement? to love without condition. 
I mean, we're always making judgment calls with people. We're always evaluating whether or not we're in good standing with somebody or not. We are always have some sort of measurement with somebody of, I can give this much because they've done this much for me. And what God's Word teaches us is that loving without condition is an act of faith. That I'm going to put you in front of me, even if all the evidence in the past has been that that's not the wisest decision to make. The last one is like, if that one was bad, this last one will just blow your mind. <laughs> we're going to forgive without limit. We're, we're going to forgive no matter how big the offense is and no matter how many times it's been repeated, we're going to forgive. We're going to remove the debt that was created when they hurt me. A- a- and by faith, listen, it's only by faith that you can do these unseen things with with that idea where I don't see how this is going to work out, but I'm going to fully trust that what God says and teaches about these things are true, even if it has some consequences involved in it. And really, what, the reason we would do that is not because we are better than anybody or they measure up to a certain standard that we have, but because God is 100% faithful. That he tell, if He tells us to welcome without judgment, to love without condition to forgive without limit that His way is best. And we can trust, as crazy as that sounds, we can trust that God has a good and perfect plan for us in the midst of it all. And that's why Hebrews 11 was written. That's why we have this list. Let's take a look at the list here for just a second. I I was looking at this this week, and and a list of 20-odd, 20-plus things Just think of it this way. Abel, in verse 4, it says, he gave an acceptable sacrifice. That was his act of faith. He worshipped God in the right way. You understand you can't make up how you worship God? That a lot of people have died trying to do that in the the Word of God? That that you can't say, I'm going to worship you this way, God, but God has told us how to worship Him? And Abel here, it says, he he was worshipping, doing what God had told him by faith, hearing what God said, obeying what He's doing, By faith, he worshiped God properly and was accepted. Enoch, it says, pleased God because he walked with God his whole life. His reward was he didn't die. He just was disappeared, taken up. Didn't go through that experience of death that we all will. And because he pleased God, that was the reason he was included in this faith. Noah, it says, continued to believe God and his word and his promise And he persevered in it even when everybody else in the world was thinking he was crazy, right? I got to thinking about Noah for a second and realized that Noah and his family were saved on this ark. And it seems like the millions of people that lived on the earth, not one of them believed God. That's mind-blowing. And that would be incredible pressure on Noah and his family, but he persevered. And he saved his family. Abraham, it says, in verse 8 and then verse 9 and 10 and verse 17 and 19, actually three things about Abraham here. Number one, God called him to leave. God called him to leave the Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian, I'm sorry, the, I'm mixing up Moses and Abraham. God called him to leave his land in Ur and come to the promised land. Now, all of you have moved before. All of you know what it takes to do a transition. All of you know what it ha- means to go to a different place, different culture, different, where they don't speak the same language, right? And in all of this, like that takes incredible faith to do that very thing. We see here that in verses 9 and 10, it says when he reached the promised land, he, he realized that he had to live there the entirety of his life as a foreigner. God promised him the land, but he was a foreigner the whole time that he lived there. In verses 17 and 19, it says that when God told him to sacrifice his son Isaac, who he had promised through Isaac, I'm going to make you a nation, that he said, you know what? If I have to kill my son, I believe God will raise him from the dead. That's the kind of faith that's been on display here. Sarah, it says in verse 11, conceived when she was too old, and there are now innumerable descendants from her. Isaac, he invoked the future blessings on his son. He knew he would never see those blessings, but he said to his sons, you have this blessing. Jacob blessed the sons of Joseph, believing the same promises of God that were given to all the patriarchs. Joseph realized that he was going to die in Egypt and said, take my bones to the promised land that we've never had as a whole country. He believed it was still going to happen. 
And in the Exodus, his bones were taken because of his faith. Moses' parents, in verse 23, believed that they could hide their son and that God was above the edict of the king of the land. That doing things God's way and saving your son was more important than killing your son the way the Pharaoh had told him to. As a result, we see Moses mentioned three different things about his faith. First, he chose God, God's reward, not earthly reward. He chose to follow after God's people and after having all the luxuries of Egypt and being potentially the next in line for the kingdom, he said, you know what, I'm going to forsake all of that and go live in the desert for 40 years. Then we see here that he was not afraid to anger the king because he saw the invisible God. And so he came and he had that whole thing with Pharaoh and all the plagues that happened there. And then finally, the final plague was the Passover where they sprinkled the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and he believed that his oldest son would indeed be saved. And he was. Hebrews 11 then goes into from people to events. And the event is the Red Sea where the people of Israel crossed on dry land believing what God had promised them would be true, that they would make it through to safety even though they were surrounded by three sides by the greatest army in the world had seen to that point. And then that army drowned in the very same waters. Then the event of Jericho where the military strategy was walk around the building and it'll fall down. I dare you to go challenge a general to do that in his military strategy. And yet God was supernaturally working there. Rahab is somebody who is noted as a prostitute, but her righteousness is really why she's in this hall of faith. Because she believed the God of Israel and not the pagan gods that she had followed, and she saved them. Then we see really people who are doubles. We see Gideon and Barak. And really the demonstration of them is both weakness. And even though there's weakness, God is faithful Then we see Samson and Jephthah, which is like, why in the world did these two guys make the list? Think about the moral condition of Samson. Think about the arrogance of Jephthah. So we have to realize that these men and women that are on this list aren't there because they are good. They're not there because they've done these wonderful things and we should look at their faith and go, wow, weren't they amazingly faithful? It's not about the characters of the story. It's about the main character of Genesis chapter 11 where we see that God is 100% faithful to His promises no matter what the obstacle is. And in this case, the obstacle was moral failure and, and poor representation by these two men. Then we see David and Samuel. They start strong, but they finish really bad. We see then the prophets and the women who had uh, children raised from the dead, and then all of the others who conquered kingdoms and enforced justice. And all throughout this, we see here, God is showing not that their faith was so amazing and we should follow after it, but God is 100% faithful to each and every person in there. He's used each and every one of them Yes, they contributed and had some measure of faith, but the greatness of faith is not their own. It is the object of their faith. It is their faith in God that is great. And so as we see all of this, really, I would suggest to you that there is a very clear direction that God is calling us to when we see Genesis, or Hebrews chapter 11. And the, really, the call is build your faith strong, endure, and don't give up today. I mean, there might be some things in your life where you're going, God, it would be crazy to believe you in this. And just like it was crazy for these men and women to, listen, their faith wasn't always great, but to have small measures of faith in a great and awesome 100% faithful God, the call is for you to endure in that same thing here today. Persevere in your faith with steadfast endurance because God promises a great reward. So I would just ask you, even as you read this list, what do you feel like stopping to believe God for today? I know you're all in church and you're not supposed to mention your unbelief at church, but that's not true. I would just ask you to identify it today. What do you have a really difficult time today believing God for? What do you have in your life right now where you feel like you can't really trust God and what He's promised in it 
for today. I think it's important to identify these things because this is the spot where our faith is currently weak. And we're trying to build a strong faith. We're not just trying to fake like we have a strong belief. We're trying to say, this is the spot where it might be a little bit weak. And in this, we're saying, let's build this faith to a place of greater strength. And I would suggest to you that that happens when we endure today because we see the 100% faithfulness of God in the past. I would suggest that we need to look at the examples in the Old Testament as Hebrews 11 has shown us to see that God is faithful in every, each and every place. And in that, to find the encouragement to hold on, to not give up, to not try to do it your own way, but instead to endure, to hupomeno to remain under whatever pressure of unbelief you're facing right now and allow God to show you, look to Him for how you will build that to a place of greater strength. You know, there's a really one of my favorite little sayings. It's a rather recent saying that's based on something that happened in history about 60 years ago. But it really came into popularity about the turn of the century. And at this point now, it's become something that is, is very common to parody and to kind of change and do some funny things with. And I wanted to show you the story of where this phrase came from, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. So let me show you this video even now. In the spring of 1939, during the build-up to war with Germany, the British government commissioned a series of propaganda posters. These posters were intended to offer the public reassurance in the dark days that lay ahead. They were required to be uniform in style and were to feature a special and handsome typeface, making them difficult for the enemy to counterfeit. They used the crown of King George VI as the only graphic device and had just two colours. Of the three final designs that went into production, the first poster carried the slogan, Your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory. The second poster had the words, Freedom is in peril, defend it with all your might. But the third design, of which over two and a half million posters were printed, simply read, Keep calm and carry on. The first two designs were distributed in September of 1939 and appeared up and down the country in shop windows and railway platforms. But the Keep Calm posters were held in reserve, intended for use only in times of crisis or invasion. In the end, the poster was never officially issued, and it remained unseen by the public until a copy turned up more than 50 years later. It was found in a second-hand bookshop called Barter Books in the northeast corner of England. Barter Books was begun in 1991 by a couple, Stuart and Mary Manley. The building used to be an old Victorian railway station. Huge rows of stacked shelves now stand in the place where the tracks would have been, but the station's old tea rooms and waiting rooms are still there. It was in 2000 that Stuart found the poster in a box of dusty old books that had been bought at auction. Mary liked it so much she had it framed and put it up near the shop till, and it proved so popular with the customers that a year later they began to sell copies. Since that time, the poster has been reproduced, parodied and trivialised, and has become a truly iconic image of the 21st century. It is hard to say exactly why such a phrase from a bygone decade would have so much appeal and resonance now. Its design is considered simple and timeless, and now commonly recognisable. However, it is perhaps the words on the poster that people find most enchanting. Like a voice out of history, it offers a very simple, warm-hearted message to inspire confidence in others during difficult times and it's something that should never fade from fashion. To keep calm and carry on. I feel so calm after hearing that. I did a great job putting that video together. But wow, what a phrase, keep calm and carry on in the midst of war. Remember what London was like in 1939. Remember the war that was raging around and the destruction that was happening and the simple message was keep calm 
and carry on. Very British in its culture. Very small in the amount of words used and the expression given, and yet there is much that's being said underneath this. I would suggest the only thing that I would change about the intent of this poster was that we would have courage or take courage from those around us. And I would say that that's not true, that we would still be frightened if we just look for the courage of those around us. But if we look to the courage that's found in a 100% faithful God, I believe that we can indeed persevere and endure in our faith with steadfastness and in the world's lingo, keep calm and carry on. It's not a scripture verse, but you understand the concept being so similar to what's being said here in Hebrews chapter 11. I guess my question then is, how do we do that? I mean, it's great to put on a poster, keep calm, but when, the world's war, when a war is raging around us, how do I keep calm? How do I persevere in a faith that has this steadfastness and this endurance when everything around me is swirling in a storm? How does that happen? It's great to hear that I should look to the past to see the examples of how God has been 100% faithful, but what is it right now that I have to believe to be able to have this kind of attitude in life? Well, I believe this, that enduring faith believes in four things that we see here in Hebrews chapter 11. Enduring faith believes, it's interesting, the author as he wrote about this list of examples about what faith is and how God's 100% faithful in each and every of these 20 plus stories, he inserts four different statements in the midst of these stories to show us how it is that we can actually show and have faith that is growing. Number one, I believe, is that we must believe what God says. If you look at it, Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3, it says, Faith is the assurance of the things hoped for and the conviction of the things not seen. That's the description we've talked about. But then notice verse 2, it says, For by it the people of old received their commendation. In other words, all the list of the people who were here, they're being commended by God for the faith that they had. And why are they being commended for their faith? It's because of verse 3. Look at it with me. Verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are invisible. I mean, this is such a powerful statement that you see all the creation around us. You look at the person next to you. You look at the creation of the world. And that, what that demonstrates is that God was able to create by using His words. That's the power of the words of God. And that if we put our trust in what God says, His Word, it's as if we had the strength to create something. That, that when we have this kind of belief that says, God said this, and for sure it's going to happen, the evidence is God spoke and creation happened, I can trust with 100% certainty all that God says. You know, so many times there's in our culture and in our worlds today, there's this debate about our origins and where we came from. And in the midst of this, what we're seeing here is that it's very clear that the origin is God's words. There, there wasn't just happenstance that happened. There wasn't chance that put us all together here. There wasn't nothing that somehow something came out of. That would be a crazy, stupid faith. Rather, there is a God who created, and His words are 100%. Here's the second thing we have to believe. I have to believe that God exists and that He rewards. Look at verse 6. We see Enoch walked with God and was faithful all of his life, and it says that he pleased God, and then now here we know why he pleased God. If, without faith, it's impossible to please Him, so he had faith, but what was his faith in? What was he believing? It says, for him... For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. And so if we're going to have a strong faith, a faith that we're able to trust God for the future things in, we don't only believe what His Word says, I must believe that God exists and that He rewards. We see here that whoever draws near to God, that means that you meet the standard to have this relationship with God, you have to believe two things. Number one, you have to believe that God exists. And number two, you have to believe that He rewards those who seek Him. 
He's talking to believers here. If you're a believer and you're seeking after God, you need to know there is a reward that God is going to give you. That reward, the reward systems, like it's kind of like children in lollipops, right? If you obey this, I'll give you this lollipop. But it's so much grander and better than that. And that's why the third thing that we believe comes really is built off, off of this. I must believe the eternal is better than the present. And that's verses 13 to 16. We see that in verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised. And for some people, they well, that's a bummer. If I don't get it here now, then, I, then it's not worth it. You need to know that every one of us has a longing for something more than here and now. And that longing is only fulfilled in the promises that come with eternity with, with God. And so why this, this is why this is so important. They, it says here, they seen them and they greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. So their perspective was, hey, the things of this earth, I'm a foreigner in earth as a whole. So when you feel like a foreigner here in Malaysia because you move from wherever, right? Like, like you should feel like that no matter where you go in the earth because as a believer, we're foreigners here. Then goes on to say, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. I'm looking for something better. And if they had been thinking of the land from which they had come out of, they would have had the opportunity to return. Don't, don't long for the things of the earth. Long for what is going on ahead of us. But as it is, it says in verse 16, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Can't, I, I still can't get my mind around that phrase. That God's not ashamed to be called God by me when I have this kind of faith. For he has prepared for them a city. You know, the city is an important thing. Uh, in, in a time where it, there was a transient existence and you kind of moved around and you, and you put your tent up here and there and you lived there for a while and then you moved to the next place, a city was a revolutionary idea in the ancient world. And in that, the foundations of a city would offer a permanent established and protected home. To the cultured men in the first century, the city was the highest form of civilized existence. And we now look for such a habitation as well, namely the new Jerusalem. See, we should be longing for this city that God has is, is promised to us. You understand that there's this city, this new Jerusalem, that is the reward for those who have faith in Christ. That instead of an eternity in the absence of God, which, we're going to, which is called hell, that you have this heavenly experience in the city of God, the Jerusalem, that will be suspended between the new heaven and the new earth. I mean, this is an awesome reward that we, that we get to have. And, and a city that provides permanence and foundation and protection is what we should be longing for. The eternal is better than the present. Here's the last thing you have to believe. I must believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you look at Hebrews 11, verses 39 to 40, you say, see this, all these things, though commended through their, all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us. What, what is, what's better than the promises that He had given to them? Well, it's this relationship that's restored through Jesus Christ. It's believing in the resurrection of Jesus that will unite all believers with God in heaven. And so in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there's such a powerful statement, such a good statement for an international church, but even better for anybody who's a believer. It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The great unifying factor is Jesus Christ. And when you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, when you believe that God sent His Son to earth, took on the form of humanity, died the death that we all deserved, but then was raised to life, conquering death and sin, when you put your trust and belief in that, that's the beginning of your faith walk with God, and it is the, it is the continual reminder of how to walk in faith with God for the rest of our lives. So when God says something crazy, I was thinking about this, like what was the craziest thing God said on this list? And I don't know which one it is, quite honestly, but the one that caught my attention was Jericho. 
So think about this. This massive couple million population turns up in front of an ancient city to conquer it. And everybody in the city knows that this people is going to try to overrun the city. And so they, they get ready and the walls are thick and wide and the, all the armaments and all the soldiers are there and ready to go. And so when the battle, when the conflict begins to happen, it's a seven-day battle. But on day one, all that happens is they, the people that are trying to attack walk around the city once. And that might have been a little bit scary, right? Except day two comes around and all they do is walk around the city. And day three, they walk around the city once more. I mean, if you're a soldier sitting on the wall, if you're a general, you're like a little bit concerned, but you think, uh, these people are idiots. That's not the way anybody conquers anything. You don't just walk around cities. We're not giving up because you're walking around our city is what we're saying, right? So the fourth day, they walk around again. And the fifth day, they walk around again. And it, I mean, the soldiers are probably like, yeah, we're, we're just going to take it easy because they're walking again. No reason to be concerned. Sit back and relax. Day six, they do it again. All right? Day seven, something different happens. They walk around the city one time, but then they keep going. It's like, well, I guess they're, uh, they're just getting exercised and getting ready for this whole thing, right? And then they, they do I mean, it's just crazy and ridiculous and seemingly reckless that we're going to win a physical military battle by walking around the city. And yet, in all of that, we see here the demonstration in each illustration. Listen, we could do a whole series on each of the 22 different things that are mentioned here. We could do a whole series and demonstrate different levels of faith and different ways that God interacted and showed Himself great. But when we see it as a whole, we recognize that we can put our trust, we can persevere, we can endure because God is 100% faithful no matter how crazy it seems to do what He says. So really what we're doing here today is encouraging you to build a strong faith for the future. To build a strong faith beyond when the theme ends, this being the last message, and into 2019, and 2020, and to continue to build your faith stronger and stronger because if you don't have firm faith, you don't have faith at all. And in that, I would just encourage you that the way that that happens is, number one, you review the past faithfulness of God in your life, in the lives of other saints, in the lives of those who've gone before us that are recorded in Scripture. Like if your faith is wavering and you're like, man, I don't, I can't, I'm not sure if I can do what God's telling me to do. I know God says this to be true, but I'm not sure I can do that. I would just say that you need to immediately get your eyes on something that will show that God is 100% faithful and do it over and over again. Number two, grow in your understanding and trust of God. Make it personal is what we're saying here. It's great to look at what happened in the past, but make it personal and say, how has God grown me in this last year? What has God taken me through where I was weaker then than I am now? And if you can't get a view of in the last year that God has strengthened you in some way, then just expand that out a little bit further. And see again over and over that no matter how bad you are, no matter how messed up you've made things, that God's faithful. And building your faith in Him and building you to actively trust Him each day. And then finally, number three, to endure. To remain under the pressure of whatever it is that is testing your faith right now. To endure and to persevere and to be steadfast, even though all the input says, this is crazy, this is reckless. If God has said it, like creation coming into existence, He will accomplish whatever it is that you're struggling with right now in His timing. So what we're saying here is persevere in your faith with steadfast endurance because God's promises are a great reward. So when you get to the end and you're lying on your deathbed, you can be at a spot where you know what eternal life is. So that as you wallow through the dust and of daily life, you can see the blessedness of the resurrection. So that as you confront the sin that you may stumble and be tempted and fall into, you can remember you're declared righteous before God. You're justified. That when you're overwhelmed by some endless misery, you can see the blessing that God has given to you in this life. That as you endure hunger and thirst, 
You praise God for the abundance that He's given. And when it seems like God is deaf to your cries, you can remember God will help. As one great commentator in the past said, what should we do if we had not faith and hope to lean on and if our mind did not emerge amidst the darkness above the world by the shining of the Word and the Spirit of God? Hebrews 11 is that very shining example. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the encouragement and the challenge that comes from it. I thank You for the reminder, even as we looked at today, of how You have acted faithfully 100% of the time in the past. And that that trajectory tells us that we can trust You 100% of the time in the coming days. Lord, I pray that You would work in each and every heart here today, each and every person, every soul represented, Lord. Would You build a stronger faith as a result of hearing the Word of God and seeing how You over and over have demonstrated that You do what You say that you are who you are, and that you will do it again as we put our trust in you. Lord, show us that even as we sing those words in Christ's name.